Putin recognizes in Biden and in the Biden administration and in this government deep corruption. We now know that the United States government via uh, possibly the NSA, certainly the CIA, did everything short of assassinating Carlson in order to prevent this interview. Ukraine and Russia are both deeply, deeply corrupt countries, deeply corrupt societies, but unfortunately, so is the United States, and it pains me to say this. We are no longer under Democrats. We are no longer the global good guys. We become a global villain. Well, it's great to be back in the studio. And, um, you know, I've been gone for, <laughs> for it feels like forever. I, um, I I think I was gone for a month, but it felt like I was gone for six months. And as many of you will know, if you followed me on social media, you will know that I was um, first, you know, I flew to Zurich and then I went from Zurich to Davos. I went to the World Economic Forum and, you know, sat is kind of a mole uh, in the midst of all the globalists. And then I went from there back to Zurich, flew to um, to London uh, where I had some things to do. And then, of course, I was planning to go to Scotland to see my friend uh, Jim Ferguson, but that didn't play out because of a um, uh, because of a snowstorm in the highlands of Scotland, which is where he's from, and it meant I might get stuck there, and I couldn't risk that because I had to be in Cairo, Egypt, for uh, yet other meetings. And by the way, I want to say this. If you want to have a good trip, something needs to go wrong because if it doesn't, you won't remember it. You won't remember a vacation. You won't be remember a family trip, a business trip, if everything goes exactly as planned. And I have to say, things did not go exactly as planned on this particular trip. But no matter, I stayed in London a little bit longer uh, because I couldn't go to the highlands of Scotland and uh, got a few things done, did loads of interviews. Then I was in Cairo. And uh, Egypt is eternally fascinating to me. And... Um, you know, in addition to seeing things that I've seen before, like Saqqara and the uh, the pyramids at Giza and the Grand Bazaar and so forth, um, I was at Garbage City, which we'll tell you a little bit about in an upcoming uh, show that we will do that puts some of these things um, together. And this is where Christians within um, Egypt's predominantly Muslim society are more or less forced to live. I mean, they they are not allowed to operate with uh, the same kind of freedoms that Muslims do. They are marginalized in the culture. We don't marginalize them in the West. Uh, that is to say Muslims, we don't marginalize them in the, in, in the West, but they, Muslim countries do marginalize Christians. They don't give them full participation in society um, or in the economy. And so Garbage City, and there's several of these little garbage cities. I went to the largest one uh, around uh, Cairo, and this is where the Christian population is. And it's called that because their whole economy surrounds garbage because the collection, recycling, and the sale of garbage is one of the few things that they're actually allowed to do. But again, we're going to tell you about that a little bit later. Then I was in Rome and uh, now back here. And I'm still very jet lagged, um, and I'm actually kind of excited I uh, kind of uh, fired up to talk a little bit about the Tucker Carlson, uh, Vladimir Putin interview, which is gaining so much attention. But before I do that, just to tease a little bit of, you know, we had a a documentary on the World Economic Forum that we dropped, uh, oh, maybe 10 days ago, a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. It is superb. Uh, the combined efforts of, um, you know, what I was doing in Davos, and uh, the team in Dallas, we put together um, really an excellent documentary that will give you a behind the scenes look at what the World Economic Forum, what the globalists, what the fascists, and these people are fascists, what they're doing. So you'll be able to, um, to, to see that. Uh, so be looking for that. Uh, I could have discussed all of it today, but I didn't want to today because, you know, if you've ever been on... <laughs> You know, a trip where in a trip like this, where you're moving from one thing to the next, you need time to process. I mean, I was I was moving to the next city 
before I really had time to process the last one. And then I was moving from that city to yet the next where now I have two cities um, to process. Point being, I wanted a little bit of time before we put that second documentary together. And documentary is such a, you know, it's a word that feels very boring. You know, you hear that and you go, you, you kind of stiffen slightly because you think it will sound so, you know, just sounds so boring and uninteresting. I promise you, you won't think that. Um, we're putting together the footage that I shot with an iPhone. Uh, as I was going through the Grand Bazaar of, uh, of Cairo, as I was uh, in Rome, as I was at the World Economic Forum, as I was in London, as I was in Oxford visiting my friend, um, Professor John Lennox, a mathematician at Oxford University, as I was at the pyramids, all these different places. And all of it relates, by the way, because while each of these things, they feel perhaps to you um, unrelated, uh, they're related by a globalist thread because everywhere that I was going, people are reacting to globalism. They're reacting to globalism. They're reacting negatively. I, I, you hardly see on our media here uh, the massive protests that are taking place in Europe. Um, the farmers who have um, blocked highways and roads. Hilariously, by the way, uh, the Spanish police, in an attempt to stop some of these farmers from protesting, they block the road. And what do the farmers do? You know, they're driving tractors. Tractors are made for driving off-road. <laughs> that's, that's what they're made for. And so all these farmers did was they just veered off of the highway. They went through a field, which is their their natural habitat, and they went straight back onto the road. <laughs> so it was actually quite funny. And um, Jim Ferguson, you know, is is uh, is at the the heart of a lot of these things that are taking place. But you are sensing that people around the world are rising up against the growing globalist threat. And by globalist, I mean a new kind of fascism. These are people who are anti-human. They're anti-human. I want to be very clear as you watch the Ideas Have po uh, Consequences podcast. I am, we are anti-globalists. And I am pro-human, pro-human. I am pro-human through and through. These people are not. And um, whether or not it's being reported on our media or not, I promise you that there is a there is a growing resistance to what this globalist threat represents, and it's taking place in a variety of countries throughout Europe and indeed throughout the world. And I was engaging with people in all of these countries who don't like what they see happening. So it's going to be interesting to see if the anti-globalists, the pro-human faction around the world, the populists, uh, as some might call them, will link arms uh, against the globalist threat and defeat it. I certainly hope that that is the case. So that's in an upcoming episode that we're preparing for you. But Right now, you know, here I get home, <laughs> um, I'm exhausted, I have jet lag, and all of the talk is about Tucker Carlson's interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And, um, you know, when I got home, the, the interview hadn't taken place yet, but now it has, and I've had the chance to watch roughly two hours, I guess I didn't time it, to see exactly how long it was, but I would say probably a, a couple of hours. And I'm going to dissect it for you if you haven't had the chance um, to, to do this. Now, one of the first things that I want to say to you about it is, well, two things. First of all, the interview itself is fascinating. It's fascinating. And not necessarily because Carlson speaks that much or asks a lot of penetrating questions. Indeed, I wouldn't say that he actually did. He simply got out of the way and let Vladimir Putin speak. And it was, it was almost a two-hour monologue by Putin. And I have to say this, Putin comes off with clarity of mind. He comes off with a clear understanding of geopolitics. And he comes off with a very clear understanding of our politics and of his own history and of the history of Ukraine 
in the history of Russia and of U.S. Uh, in Western meddling in that country. Now, I want to say this at the outset, and unfortunately, it's unfortunate to me that you even have to say this. You know, with the Super Bowl, I am not for the Chiefs, mainly because I'm not for Taylor Swift. I'm so sick of that story. But that doesn't make me for the 49ers, <laughs> you see. Being against one doesn't make you for the other necessarily. And I, I want to be very clear here, as I have been on previous um, episodes where I've discussed Russia and I've discussed Russia's history and I've discussed um, Ukraine and Ukraine's history, the corruption in both uh, countries and this war. But I want to reiterate this. There will always be people who are prepared to say, if you say anything negative, about Ukraine, well, you're pro-Putin. No, I'm not pro-Putin. Ukraine and Russia are both deeply, deeply corrupt countries, deeply corrupt societies, deeply corrupt political um, atmospheres. But unfortunately, so is the United States, and it pains me to say this, we are no longer, under Democrats, we are no longer the global good guys. We've become a global villain. The United States has become a global villain. If you read my book, Around the World, in more than 80 days, then you will know that I have said that America's influence, and I, and I say this as a guy who's been, you know, I mean, you know, as I say, I just, I just came back from however many countries I was just in. I, I can't even remember, four or five. But... I've been around the world a lot, a lot. I've been in a lot of countries. And what you discover is, is that America's influence is very Jekyll and Hyde. It's very Jekyll and Hyde. There's, there's good Dr. Jekyll that with the Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe, that rebuilt Japan and uh, wrote a constitution for that country that has served them well now in the post-World War II world very effectively, that brought Japan from a feudalistic, militaristic, fascist, emperor-worshipping culture to a democracy, um, to an economic superpower, to a free people. That's the good Dr. Jekyll. That's, that's the America I love. That's the America that I feel patriotic about. Then there's the Mr. Hyde, the evil Mr. Hyde, who pushes um, a wicked and sordid agenda throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout South America, um, that topples freely elected regimes, um, that money launders, that starts wars, um, that cynically uses other countries for our own nefarious purposes. This has generally happened, though not exclusively, it has generally happened under democratic presidents, but not with Ukraine. Everyone's gonna encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain, and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do, and undoubtedly some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine, and I wanna tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. 
can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. When it comes to Ukraine, it is the, it is, you know, the uniparty that has done this. It has been from Bill Clinton, who uh, urged the Ukrainians, you know, are halfway around the world. They are a border state with Russia. But we said to them, hey, give up your nuclear deterrent. Give up your nuclear weapons. We'll protect you. And they did. It was very foolish. It's foolish of us to encourage them to do it. But they did it. And then with the two Bush administrations, by that I mean um, George W. Bush's um, two administrations, um, we um, were, the CIA was engaged in uh, very questionable, corrupt activities in Ukraine. Obama carried that on. Um, it ended under Trump, who was uh, you know, really trying to investigate what exactly are Democrats doing in Ukraine. You can find some of these phone conversations, by the way, uh, that were recorded you know, online. You can listen as Trump is asking questions about what exactly is taking place in that country. Well, we now know that at the very least, there were um, bio labs that we were, we were producing, it seems, um, chemical weapons in that country. We also know um, of money laundering. We know of the corrupt Biden crime families. Uh, activities in that country where they're profiting massively um, off of the uh, Ukrainian um, government. And now we also know that we engineered in 2014 a coup d'etat of a freely elected government. This is the kind of stuff. This is the Mr. Hyde, the evil Mr. Hyde's influence that you find in various places around the world where I, as an American, am ashamed of what my country has done in some of these instances. Certainly not all. Again, good Dr. Jekyll has had a massively positive influence around the world, but there is also that evil side of American foreign policy. And it <laughs> that's, that part of America's influence is um, all over our activities in Ukraine. Now, a couple of things about this interview that intrigue me. First of all, I want to say this at the, um, the front end. I admire Tucker Carlson for doing this. We now know um, that the United States government via uh, possibly the NSA, certainly the CIA, did everything short of assassinating Carlson in order to, pr to prevent this interview. They did not want this interview to take place. Carlson tells us that the interview has been three years in the making. And they've been working on this for quite some time. So there's that, um, the pressure from the United States government. And they've been putting um, pressure on Carlson for quite some time. And who knows what repercussions he may yet um, face. Then there's Putin, who is himself corrupt. And um, Putin, we know, has assassinated journalists, Russian, albeit Russian journalists, like Tucker Carlson in his own country. Guys like Tucker Carlson who are ferreting out Putin's corruption mysteriously get shot in the head, disappear, killed, murdered. This has happened with some regularity over the 20 years that Vladimir Putin has been in office. So we are dealing with two very deeply corrupt presidents. Now, I will say that there's a massive difference between the two of them. I, I said on Twitter <laughs> that no one, no one recognizes a criminal, can spot an, a, another criminal like a criminal. They can sniff each other out. They can... They can spot each other a mile away, and that's because they recognize in other people their own qualities. They can see that in other people. Putin recognizes in Biden and in the Biden administration and in this government deep corruption. Now, he had no reason to want to assassinate Tucker Carlson, hence the reason Tucker Carlson would know that, and hence the reason he'd be going 
um, to Russia. Tucker Carlson would recognize that Putin wanted to get his side of the story out, and he was willing to go and listen to him and let people like you and me make our own uh, decisions about it. And by the way, the claim that somehow that Tucker Carlson was a traitor in conducting this interview is patently absurd. Uh, Members of leftist media, legacy media, have been interviewing Putin on and off uh, for many years and as recently as 2021. But I admire Carlson's courage in going and conducting this interview. As I, as I said, Carlson was in a no-win situation. On the one hand, he needed to appear tough. On the other, he needed to appear fair. And yet he was doing it all on Putin's home turf. And that's not nothing. But I find it very interesting that Putin has quite readily identified the corruption of this particular administration. And he he spent a fair amount of time making the case and laying it out. Now, Carlson himself was a little annoyed, and he would say this in a, you know, a little bit of a preamble uh, before the interview himself, one that he recorded after the interview took place. He expressed a kind of frustration with what Putin had done. He said, you know, that Putin had gone on this 30, 40 minute uh, monologue about Russia's history. And he first interpreted that as a filibuster technique. He thought, you know, we we didn't know how much time we had to interview Putin. And we thought he was just going to use up the entire time just talking about Russia's history as a way of stalling me from asking him any really tough questions. But he said, I later realized that wasn't what he was doing, that he was being very sincere. Now, I would go further than that. I would say that Putin was not only being sincere, I would say that that possibly Carlson, who who isn't a Russian historian, didn't quite understand the argument that Putin was trying to make. And listen, I say this, I say this as uh, you know, somebody who has two degrees in, in Russian history, who's been in Ukraine and Russia, both of those countries many times who taught Russian history, Russian literature. I'm not claiming to be a Russian expert. I'm not sure that there really are any, given um, the difficulties uh, with this country. But I will say this. We as Americans, in part because we have a very short history as as a country. I mean, again, I just came from Egypt. I mean, Khufu, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, was constructed in roughly 26, 2700 BC. (laughs) So then, you know, you're walking through central Rome and there you are at the Pantheon, let's say. Pantheon was constructed in first century AD. So as old as the Pantheon is, The Great Pyramid of Khufu, or Cheops, as the Greeks called it, was built 2,600 years before that. And yet, (laughs) the Pantheon was constructed about 1,700 years before the founding of the United States. So do you begin to see how young our history really is? Add to this the fact That ours is a country that through immigration, and I'm not speaking of the mass immigration as of late, though that would certainly apply, but historically, through immigration, we have been a people whose citizenry, whose population is constantly being renewed. And the result of that is that there isn't, except for, say, uh, among uh, some very old families uh, that have been established for um, for a long time in the United States, there isn't a long cultural memory. Uh, many of the immigrants who have come to this country, including those who first founded it, were eager to leave behind their history. They want to remember it. My own grandmother um, on my my mother's side uh, was from Ireland, came came to uh, went to Canada you know, when she was 17 years of age, never wanted to talk about Ireland. You bring up Ireland, she wasn't interested. Uh, When my mom wanted to go there, wanted to tell her about it, my grandmother wasn't interested. She didn't want to go. She she was not interested in that history. Did not matter to her. This is not uncommon 
with the people who founded this country. They were leaving behind a history. The point I'm making is simply this. We as a people don't fully appreciate history. We don't. And so when we encounter ancient cultures, and Russia is ancient compared to the United States, was founded in the ninth century. It's not that old compared to, let's say, um, Britain. London, known as Londinium, was founded in 43 AD. So about 800 years before the founding of Russia. And yet it's not that old, as I just pointed out, compared to Rome or compared to Egyptian civilization. But Russia is very old compared to the United States. Very old compared to the United States. About, about mm, eight, 900 years older than the United States. So when Vladimir Putin begins telling Tucker Carlson the history of Russia and Ukraine, which he sees as a single entity, and this is important, Tucker Carlson is thinking to himself, what in the world? I didn't come here to discuss Russia's history in the ninth century. What does that have to do with anything? Well, from Putin's point of view, it had everything to do with their discussion. Just to use by way of an example to show you that Putin isn't unique in this regard. After 9-11, Osama bin Laden, in offering justification for the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York and the Pentagon, would begin with the Crusades. The Crusades. And the average American is thinking to themselves, what? <laughs> what? What do the Crusades have to do with anything? How does this relate to us? We don't have anything to do with that. But see, in Osama bin Laden's mind, it, it does. As I say, I was just in Cairo. You bring up 9-11 there, they will bring up um, the Crusades, which is fine with me because they will say that the grievance of Muslims against Europeans, against the West in general, began with the Crusades, the, the European invasion into the Middle East. Now, that suits me fine because most of them are not aware of the fact that the Muslim invasion of Europe took place almost 300 years before that. They invaded through Spain. They were defeated at the Battle of Tours. Otherwise, they might have conquered the whole of Europe. But many of them are not aware of this. They see the Europeans as the aggressors, as the one who started this ancient conflict. But it wasn't. They, in fact, invaded Europe first. That's where they will go. Pope John Paul II, who's kind of a hero to me, he did some questionable things towards the end, but I... I, as a Protestant, love Pope John Paul II. I place him right there with Ronald Reagan uh, in terms of his importance in bringing the Soviet Union down. He was a great man. In 2001, he traveled to Greece. Now, bear in mind that Greece is not Roman Catholic. It's Greek Orthodox. And there's deep resentments since the Great Schism, which took place in 1054, where the Eastern Church and the Western Church split, where we ended up with with what we call Catholicism and, uh, and Eastern Orthodoxy, of which Russian Orthodoxy is a part. Pope John Paul II went to Athens, and do you know what he did? He apologized. He apologized for the Crusaders' sacking of Constantinople in 1204. The Greeks wept with joy and gratitude for his apology. Again, as Americans, we can't really penetrate this. This to us is, is alien to our thinking. Those people who suffered as a result of the crusader sacking of Constantinople, their children are alive, their grandchildren are alive, their great-grandchildren are alive, their great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren aren't alive. Who could possibly be offended by this? Well, the Greeks were, and that is because they believe that the, the sacking of Rome, excuse me, of Constantinople led to the collapse of the Eastern Empire in 1453, and it led to Greece being dominated by Muslims for roughly um, almost 400 years. They believed it was the Catholics' fault. You guys did this to us. You attacked us. We were a brother people. 
and you weakened us until finally we fell to the Ottomans. So John Paul II comes and says, we're sorry. Shouldn't have done that. Seems, seems very strange to us. So, when Putin begins his commentary with Tucker Carlson in the ninth century and the founding of the first Russian capital at Kiev, Kiev is the capital of Ukraine, the very first Russian capital was not founded in Moscow. It wasn't founded in St. Petersburg. It was founded in what we now call Ukraine. And by the way, the word Ukraine means borderland. Borderland. The Russians have always considered it to be their frontier and absolutely vital to their survival as a people. My point, by the way, isn't that you have to believe any of this. The point is that Russians believe it. And I promise you, Vladimir Putin believes it. And the history that he lays out for Tucker Carlson is accurate. And what actually surprised me about this, and I made a little short video that we, we put on the channel, we put across um, social media, that actually surprises me about Vladimir Putin's dialogue is that he lays out what's called the Norman theory. The Norman theory is highly controversial in Russia. The Norman theory maintains that the first Russian state, as I just said, was founded at Kiev, but it wasn't founded by Russians. It was founded by what, what are called, um, in the primary chronicle, Russia's oldest native historical document. They're referred to as the Varangians or as Normans, or as you know them, as Vikings. And why it's controversial is because, according to the primary chronicle, the Russians themselves were so disorganized, were so unsophisticated, that they were not capable of self-rule. So they said, look, we're not capable of ruling ourselves, but the Vikings, they're pretty sophisticated people. Let's see if they'll come and rule over us. And the Vikings were like, sure. <laughs> Okay. And so they did. Now, I tell this story with some humor in my first book, which is a kind of history of Ukraine, which was written, published in 2011. So long before most people could find Ukraine on a map, long before, you know, saying anything negative or positive about Ukraine could be deemed to be controversial. So I can't really be confused of, yeah, excuse me, be accused of that, um, you know, having that agenda in 2011. Uh, but that book you might find amusing, you might find helpful. It's called The Grace Effect, The Grace Effect. And you will find that book on Amazon and at fine publishers and bookstores everywhere. And I urge you to, um, to get it and read it. I think, you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. But Putin lays out that history and then he starts moving forward century by century by century. And you can see Tucker Carlson's face. He's looking like, you know, you'd almost put a WTH, you know, cloud above his head as if to say, where is this going? What is this about? Why is he doing this? But there was a reason for it. And the reason is that Putin is laying out a history of Ukraine and Russia that Westerners do not understand. We have been told, we have been taught and again, I'm not saying to you that you have to believe this or disbelieve it. We have been told, we have been taught that Ukraine and Russia are two very distinct peoples and two very distinct civilizations. The Russians would say, no, not historically. Not historically. We have been a united people throughout most of our history. And... This is an absolute historical fact that you must understand or you will understand nothing as it relates to Russia. Two things here that you must understand when you watch this interview or when you're reading anything as it relates to Russian politics. The first is this, a key historical moment which Putin discusses. I actually was quite impressed with Putin's historical knowledge. He's not using notes. He's just sitting there and he's discussing for almost two hours. Um, Ukraine and Russia's history and activities. There are a couple times when Tucker Carlson asked him, when did that phone call take place with 
you know, with President Clinton or that conversation with President Bush. And he'll say, I can't tell you specifically. I don't remember exactly where that is, but it's easy for you to look up and find when that was. Because this is a matter of historical record or afterwards we'll 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 find those documents for you. He wasn't he wasn't pulling any punches. I think I think Putin was being very, to quote Carlson, very sincere. But Putin talks about the Christianization of Russia, which took place at Kiev. Now, again, the importance of this cannot be lost on you. It would be as if the founding of our country had not taken place at Boston or Philadelphia or New York or D.C., but had taken place in Ottawa or Havana or Mexico City. If that were the case, we would have a unique claim to those places. We would say Ottawa is absolutely vital. It's integral to who we are as a people. Now, that isn't what happened in our case, but it is what happened where the Russians are concerned. And so he talks about the Christianization of Russia, which took place in 988 AD. Now, that is the most fateful date in the history of Russian history. It's not 1941 with, with um, Hitler's invasion of Russia with Operation Barbarossa, 175 divisions, 4.5 million men going across the Russian frontier. June 22nd, 1940. You might think that's the most fateful date in Russian history. It isn't. You might think that it's the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Nope, not then. It's 988, and that's because in 988, the Prince of Rus, as it was called, that's where we get the term Russia, Rusians, the Rusians, um, the Rus, the Prince of Rus, Vladimir, decided that paganism didn't do it for him anymore, and he needed to get with it. Everybody had a major, you know, hip religion. And so he sent out emissaries, according to the Primary Chronicle, to investigate the various religions, major religions of the world. And they came back and they reported to him of, um, you know, Islam, of Christianity and Judaism. And um, the emissaries that he sent to um, investigate Christianity, they went to Constantinople and they saw the Hagia Sophia, which by then was already about 400 years old. And it was the most outstanding architectural feat in the world. And so after the Mohammedans, as the uh, primary chronicle <laughs> tells it, the Muslims tell him about that religion. And they say, now, you're not allowed um, to drink and you got to get circumcised. <laughs> Vladimir said, whoa, excuse me, you're not allowed to drink. He says, whoa, and this is a direct quote from the Primary Chronicle. He says, drinking is the joy of the Ruses. <laughs> so he rejects Islam simply on the basis they told him you're allowed to be allowed to drink. And I can testify to this day, drinking is the joy of the Ruses. <laughs> Sometimes you can walk in just to a souvenir shop and they'll hand you a shot of vodka. <laughs> I've had that happen to me many times. It's actually quite funny. They'll hand them out to children. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Then they tell him about Judaism, and they tell him, this is the one where they tell him he has to be circumcised. And you can picture him crossing his legs and saying, yet, <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> no, not doing that. Then they tell him about the Greek Orthodox. They tell him about Hagia Sophia, and they say, this is recorded in the Primary Chronicle, the same document that Vladimir Putin is quoting from, we knew not whether God dwelled there or in heaven. Maybe we were in heaven. Hagia Sophia is, if you've never seen it, I mean, the Turks, the Muslims have trashed it. Uh, but it still remains absolutely incredible. It's as if the dome itself, it is said, were suspended from heaven by a golden chain. 40 windows at the base of the dome, unsupported, no columns holding it up. Light flooding into it. Justinian, who commissioned its building, the Byzantine emperor, upon its completion, he walked in and he said, O Solomon, I have surpassed thee. <laughs> Meaning, I have built something that even surpasses 
your temple. Not that he ever saw it because it had been destroyed by then. But that is how amazing the Hagia Sophia, particularly for its time, for its time, for a thousand years later, they still couldn't reproduce it. Muslims to this day couldn't do it. They tried with the Blue Mosque, which is just across. It was a bad decision to put the Blue Mosque right next to the Hagia Sophia because it might look impressive if it weren't sitting next to the Hagia Sophia, but it is, and so it doesn't. And so they adopted Greek Orthodoxy, which we refer to as, of course, Russian Orthodoxy. Now, why was that a fateful day? Because all of the massive culturally convulsing societal seismic shifting events came through the Latin church, came through the West, through the Catholic church, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, they all came through the West. But you see, Russia, culturally and linguistically separated from the West because they adopted Greek Orthodoxy and two Russian monks, one by the name of Cyril, the other Methodius, adapted the Russian language that did not have an alphabet to, this, to a Greek alphabet, a modification of a Greek alphabet that we call the Cyrillic alphabet, named after one of those monks who, who achieved this. Russia was culturally and linguistically cut off from the West. So when we are talking about Russia and you're listening to Vladimir Putin, it is important that you understand that Russia's historical experience is wholly different from that of the West. They never experienced a renaissance, a reformation, an enlightenment, a scientific revolution. Barely an industrial revolution. The first, the industrial revolution began in Britain in the 1740s. It didn't begin in Russia until the first of the five-year plans in 1925, and barely then. So Russia has been lagging behind the West. Somebody said on my Twitter, you know, the, the Russians are a highly sophisticated, cultured people. Nonsense. Even the Russians themselves have said that. Read Tolstoy, read Dostoevsky, read, read Pushkin, read Chekhov. I don't think that at all. Saw them as the dark people, as a backward people who had to steal almost everything from the West, including, but not limited to, the atomic bomb. That's Russia. You have to understand this as you, as you read this. The second thing that you have to understand is that as a consequence of that, Russian, the Russian mindset is completely alien to the way Westerners think. We hear Putin talking of their history and giving this, again, 30, 40-minute monologue on Russia's history, and we think to ourselves, how does this relate to anything? From their perspective, it, it has everything to do with it because they see Ukraine and Russia as a single entity. That's the way they see it. That's the way they understand it. Now, as it relates to the events that are being discussed there, I would say this. In 1962, JFK threatened Nikita Khrushchev with thermonuclear war if Russia continued to meddle in China and place their missiles 90 miles off of our coast. Fair enough. Makes sense. But why is turnabout not fair play? As Putin says, now listen to this. L listen to what Putin says here in this part of the interview. About NATO's expansion to the east. Well, we were promised no NATO to the east, not an inch to the east, as we were told. And then what? They said, well, it's not enshrined on paper, so we'll expand. So there were five waves of expansion. The Baltic states, the whole of Eastern Europe, and so on. 
И вот теперь по кругу. And now I come to the main thing. They have come to the Ukraine, ultimately. In 2008, at the summit in Bucharest, they declared that the doors for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO were open. Now about how decisions are made there. Germany, France seem to be against it, as well as some other European countries. But then, as it turned out, later President Bush, and he's such a tough guy, a tough politician, as I was told later, he exerted pressure on us and we had to agree. It's ridiculous, it's like kindergarten. Where are the guarantees? What kindergarten is this? What kind of people are these? Who are they? You see, they were pressed, they agreed. And then they say, Ukraine won't be in the NATO, you know? I say, I don't know. I know you agreed in 2008. Why won't you agree in the future? Well, they pressed us then. I say, why won't they press you tomorrow? And you'll agree again. Well, it's nonsensical. Who's there to talk to? I just don't understand. We're ready to talk. But with whom? Where are the guarantees? None. So they started to develop the territory of Ukraine. Whatever is there, I have told you the background, how this territory developed, what kind of relations there were with Russia. Every second or third person there has always had some ties with Russia. And during the elections in already independent, sovereign Ukraine, which gained its independence as a result of the declaration of independence, and by the way, it says that Ukraine is a neutral state, and in 2008, suddenly the doors or gates to NATO were open to it. Oh, come on. This is not how we agreed. Now, all the presidents that have come to power in Ukraine, they relied on electorate with a good attitude to Russia in one way or the other. This is the southeast of Ukraine. This is a large number of people. And it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate, which had a positive attitude towards Russia. Viktor Yanukovych came to power and how? The first time he won after President Kuchma, they organized the third round, which is not provided for in the constitution of Ukraine. This is a coup d'etat. Just imagine, someone in the United States wouldn't like the outcome. In 2014? Before that. No, this was before that. After President Kuchma, Viktor Yanukovych won the elections. However, his opponents did not recognize that victory. The US supported the opposition and the third round was scheduled. What is this? This is a coup. The US supported it and the winner of the third round came to power. Imagine if in the US something was not to someone's liking and the third round of election, which the US constitution does not provide for, was organized. Nonetheless, it was done in Ukraine. Okay, Viktor Yushchenko, who was considered a pro-Western politician, came to power. Okay. Now Putin is there re capping um, <clears throat> what took place, and accurately, what took place in Ukraine and led to the Russian invasion of um, the eastern provinces of that country in 2014. And what he's saying is this, is that he had been given guarantees that NATO, which is a military organization that existed during the Cold War, presumably there would be no need for NATO post-1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But oddly, He's pointing out, not only does NATO still exist, but after guarantees that had nothing to do with us. I mean, NATO had existed for one purpose. It was established post-World War II during the Cold War for one purpose, and that was to, vend, to defend against a Russian invasion of Western Europe. So why does it still exist? So Putin says, basically, he... Yeah, uh, during the interview, uh, not necessarily during this particular clip, but he said he, you know, he, he mentioned this to various American presidents. What was the purpose of this organization? He said, I received uh, um, assurances that had nothing to do with us. He said it was to protect against a nuclear strike from Iran, which, of course, he said is ridiculous. But anyway, he says that was their justification for maintaining NATO. And, and yet, in spite of guarantees, of no meddling in Ukraine and of no eastward expansion of NATO, NATO, he points out, did 
continue to expand. In 2004 alone, NATO annexed the Russian border states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. So again, Khrush- uh, excuse me, JFK was prepared to go to war with Khrushchev, with Russia, in 1962 over Russian meddling in Cuba, 90 miles off of our border, off uh, the coast of Florida. But now here we are, not 90 miles off of Russia's border, not 30 miles off of Russia's border, not 10. We're on Russia's border through, says Putin, accurately, our puppet organization, NATO. We annexed three Russian border states. And Putin says, we did nothing, though this was aggressive. This was a very aggressive move towards us. We wanted that we were fine with them maintaining independence, provided that they were not turned against us. He says, but now this is what happened. But in that same year, NATO also annexed Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, also in the East. Not necessarily border states, but also in the East. And he says, this, this is starting to feel like we're getting encircled. He says, but the United States again says, well, it has nothing to do with you. It's, it's about Iran. We're defending against Iran. And then he said, we were guaranteed in 2008 that Ukraine, we were okay with Ukrainian independence. Fine. If they want to be independent, they can remain independent, provided that they are not turned against us. That's what he says. And what does the U.S. do? And by the way, this is fact. The Obama administration's CIA toppled a freely elected, ostensibly a freely elected Ukrainian government, Ukrainian regime president because he was pro-Russian. He had a friendly relationship with Russia. We toppled that government, violating international law and um, Ukraine's own constitution to then install a pro-Western, pro-American government. That took place in 2014, and that is when Putin invaded the East. Now, what I would have you understand about this is that how is it that all of the billion dollars, billions of dollars that are spent on Washington think tanks, that all of them would say, after this invasion, We couldn't see this coming. You'll recall that when this war began, that there was a lot of talk about Putin being crazy. He's insane. He's unstable. He has some kind of long COVID, it was suggested, that was affecting his thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an utterly predictable move. Any, any, student of Russian History 101 could have told you this was coming. And it is because, as I have said, and the reason that Putin laid out the case that he did beginning in the ninth century, because he wanted Tucker Carlson, you must understand, Russia was founded in what you call Ukraine and what we call a borderland. This, this, isn't, this isn't new for us. Our relationship with what you refer to as Ukraine is long and complicated. Khrushchev was a Ukrainian. Leonid Brezhnev was a Ukrainian. I mean, these are this is this is how tied together these countries are. Furthermore, while Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania annexing them to NATO was very threatening to Russia, they don't consider those countries vital to their survival. They have always considered Ukraine vital to their survival. Why is that? Because it's their access to a warm water port and it is uh, their breadbasket. Russia is too northerly to grow the grain that is necessary to sustain their population. They've grown it historically in Ukraine. Again, my point here isn't that you be pro-Putin. My point that I really want to drive home here is that if Putin is Mao or Hitler or Stalin, whatever you believe that he is, 
all the more reason for us to be very careful in our foreign policy and all the more reason for us not to go and poke the Russian bear. We absolutely provoked this war. We provoked it. We provoked it by annex, by expanding NATO eastward all the way to their border. You, Russia was responding exactly the way JFK did when Russia was meddling in Cuba. We felt threatened by a Russian president's presence 90 miles off of our border. They feel deeply threatened by our missiles, not just off their border, on their border. And by us toppling a regime where we said we were going to stay out, we would allow Ukraine to remain independent. And that was Putin's position. We were okay with that, with an independent Ukraine that was neither pro-Western or pro-Russian, just independent, friendly. But you weaponized Ukraine against us. And we had no choice. Therefore, we invaded. That is Putin's position. That is where he is coming from. He is saying we felt utterly surrounded and um, so we felt that we had no choice but to invade. Now, this monologue is fascinating to me. You watch the whole thing, and I would, I would encourage you to do so. Um, make up your own mind. I mean, the, the media that is telling you not to watch it, <laughs> they're all watching it and commenting on it. It's the Barbara Streisand effect. You know the Streisand effect that says the more you tell people not to do something, the more publicity it gets? the more likely they are to do it. That's, that's what's happening. This has been great publicity for Tucker Carlson's new network. <laughs> I saw that this uh, last look, it had over a million views. You know, it's only been up for hours, you know, so it's, uh, it's going gangbusters. But I, I, I want you to watch it. Hopefully, I've provided you with a little bit of a lens. You don't, you don't even really even have to watch it. There's nothing... There's nothing in their body language or visuals that is actually important for you to see. I, in fact, you're not even hearing Putin's voice. What you're hearing is, is an interpreter, a translator. Just turn it on in the car in your commute and listen to it. You will be fascinated. Tucker Carlson asked him another, a number of questions about, you know, Putin claims to be a Christian. He says, you know, what, what does that mean to you? When you look around and you see particular events that are taking place, or, or do, you, do you see a God who is at work in any of this? And I want to make this distinction that I think is a very important distinction here. I have said to you, no one can, can spot a criminal so much as another criminal. And Putin recognizes the criminality of the Biden administration. He can see, you know, Putin is himself a tyrant. He has an election rigor. He recognizes that in, in the Democrats. He recognizes that in Obama. He recognizes that in Biden. But there's this very key difference between Putin and Biden. Putin will do anything for Russia because he is a Russian patriot. He will do anything for Russia. Biden will do anything for Biden. Biden will and has sold his soul to the globalists. And that's a very key difference about the two. And Putin recognizes that in Biden. And he more or less says that. He's saying, Biden isn't calling the shots here. He's not the guy who's doing this. There, there are people behind the scenes who are doing this, and he doesn't call them globalists, but he uses language that says essentially the same thing. And that is what is going on here. So if you want to understand what's taking place with this particular war, I would suggest to you that we, we uh, in fact, I, I would just argue flat out um, that we uh, provoke this war. And by the way, I want to show you this headline because I think it is an important headline. It's from The Guardian nine years ago. The Guardian is way to the left. I've been attacked by The Guardian three times. <laughs> so I know this about The Guardian quite intimately. But The Guardian nailed this nine years ago. Here's the headline. It's not Russia that's pushed Ukraine to the brink of war. And then the, you know, the subtitle here, subheading says, the attempt to lever Kiev into a Western camp by ousting an elected leader made conflict certain. It could be a threat to us all. That was true nine years ago. It's true now, almost 10 years ago.
It is true now. We are in danger of global thermonuclear war due to the stupidity of successive presidents in the United States, both Democrat and Republican. And I would say the most dangerous of them all has been Obama and now Biden. Uh, we need a guy like Trump to prevent us from ending up in, uh, in a world war uh, with Russia. That's where this seems to be going. But do watch this. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Decide for yourself. It's, it's a very interesting interview. And um, Putin shows himself to have a great clarity of mind um, and to be someone that for that reason, I think is all the more dangerous because he is clever and he's playing chess. He's playing chess here while the West is, uh, is very inconsistent and is uh, um, provocative and um, unreasonable. He also states throughout to demonstrate how unreasonable they are. And we know this to be true. He states throughout, I'm ready to negotiate. You won't negotiate. Um, the Biden administration won't negotiate. European leaders won't negotiate. And Ukraine won't negotiate. And the reason they won't is because the Biden administration won't. They're the ones who are pulling the strings. But we're prepared to discuss some kind of reasonable end to this war. You people aren't. And I think there is truth to that. Well, I hope you will um, you'll watch the documentary that we're, we're going to release next week, which I'm pretty excited about, which will show you some of my recent global travels. And it'll tie you into some of what we're discussing today, but it promises to be very exciting. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.